Hi, everybody. My name is Cody Dreyer. I'm the pollinator ecologist for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. Um, if you're joining us today, you are here to watch at least the introduction of our um, butterfly survey. Um, and hopefully you're here to stay for the whole thing and get trained. Please turn off your mic and webcam and we will get rolling. There it is. Um, who are we? I am Cody Dreyer. I've already introduced myself, but uh, with me today, I have Olivia DeRugna. She's our Zoom moderator. She'll be the one asking you all our questions. Uh, she just popped in with her face there. Um, she's our watchable wildlife biologist um, with Game and Parks. And then we also have Sarah Nevison. She largely helps me with our in-person trainings, but um, in case I skip something important, she's here to keep me in line. Um, she's our natural legacy biologist, and it's going to help um, record and help Olivia as needed. Um, a brief outline. Um, we're going to uh, do an introduction to monarchs and regal fritillaries, do some butterfly species ID, our plant species ID, look at past results, and then look at other community science opportunities. And that'll take roughly an hour. Um, we'll see how we did on the recording. Uh, then we'll take a break and dive straight into the survey protocols. Uh, with an overview, our, then go into the butterfly survey, look at distance estimating, get into our habitat data sheet, our plant data sheet, um, our plot placement, and then finally, some tips and final questions. So I just wanna take you through what the survey looks like in about a minute. So um, we're looking for regal fritillaries and monarchs. There are also viceroy butterflies out there. We don't really care about those for this uh, survey. Um, first, I'm gonna have you guys practice your distance estimating. Then I'll assign points that you can go to um, you'll do your transects, your line surveys, looking for all the butterflies you can see um, within your transect. We're looking for the species, the sex, behavior, distance, and um, uh, angle. Next, um, you'll walk back that same line, just the opposite direction, looking at five um, floral assessments and habitat plots. Um, along the way, you will be looking for milkweed, monarchs, and regals as incidental sightings as well. So what is this survey? It is a standardized science-based methodology of pre-made transects um, that were randomly generated. Uh, it focuses on the eastern quarter of Nebraska, but this year we're kind of opening it up to be farther west as well. Um, it's not backyard counts, and it's not casual observations. So with that out of the way, we are going to jump into our introduction to monarchs and regal fritillaries. First, we're gonna start with a monarch. Um, it starts its uh, winter down in Mexico. Uh, in the fall, it flies north into Texas and Oklahoma and starts to reproduce on milkweed. Milkweed is the only thing that the monarch caterpillar will eat. Uh, milkweed has a milky sap, that's how it gets its name, it's kind of like a latex. Um, also, it is poisonous to most things. The monarchs can take in that poison, become poisonous themselves, and then use that as defense to not be eaten. Um, we have about 18 or so species of milkweed in the state. Um, they come in lots of colors, sizes, and shapes. So the monarchs will lay their eggs on the milkweed. Um, if you can just barely see the eggs here, they are very tiny, blown up. They're still not super easy to see. Then they will hatch, eat their egg, and then start to eat the milkweed. Um, they go through uh, five instars, um, shedding their skin, getting a little bitter, sh shedding their skin, getting a little bigger um, until they reach the fifth instar. They J up, um, shed their skin one last time form a pupa or a chrysalis. Um, after about two weeks, you can start to see through that chrysalis and hopefully we get a monarch to emerge as a beautiful adult monarch. 
that cycle repeats three to five times, um, depending on the latitude. We're probably in the three to four range here in Nebraska. Um, then they will fly south down to uh, Mexico again and overwinter in the OML furs. I do want to point out that there are two main populations of monarchs in the U.S. We have our eastern population and our western population. The eastern overwinters in Mexico and the western overwinters in California right along the coast. Um, in, Calif or in Mexico, they overwinter on OML furs and they just densely, densely pack onto the trees. Um, this whole patch of orange here is not a disease, it is monarchs. And I do want to point out that deforestation has happened directly adjacent to the overwintering trees of the monarch. Um, the Mexican government and a lot of the uh, locals in the area are working hard to curtail that um, logging, but um, it has been uh, there at least in the past. Uh, monarch numbers historically are, are down from the historic um, numbers. Um, we just got our numbers for this past winter, like three days ago, as of um, for the 2021-2022 season. Um, it did bounce back a little bit from 2020-2021, so that's good news. But we are hoping that our stable pop to reach a stable population level which we think is about six hectares of butterflies. Um, they pack so densely on the trees that there's no way to count individual butterflies. Um, they have to count the area that they occupy instead. Um, in California, the story is similar, but possibly worse. Um, in 2020, the Thanksgiving count was less than 2,000 total butterflies seen, um, not, not hectares, this is actual butterflies, um, but those numbers took a huge bounce back in this past uh, fall 2021, um, and the New Year's counts were also um, pretty good, so uh, we, we usually lose a fair amount of monarchs um, from Thanksgiving to New, New Year's. Um, but they were pretty decent this year. Um, monarchs are up for Endangered Species Act listing. Uh, they are warranted but precluded, which means that although they technically meet the requirements to be listed under the Endangered Species Act, there's so many other species that are doing even worse than the monarch that they don't, um, they don't make it onto the actual endangered species list. Um, last I looked, they were about two-thirds of the way down the warranted but precluded list, um, which is about 600th in line to be listed. Um, but that listing will be reevaluated in 2024. We're going to shift gears into regal fritillaries. They are another kind of monarch-sized butterfly. They had a pretty large historic range, um, but as you can see, it's we don't have a ton of current records um, from their range, and um, we're basically left with just this very small population in Pennsylvania. This is a draft map. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service wants me to specify that. that um, we, our surveys have uh, located some butterflies down in here already. So yes, this map is currently out of date already. Um, the regal fritillary will, um, females will lay their eggs in the tall grass um, near violets. Violets are the only things that um, regal fritillary caterpillars will eat. It's not on the violets, um, but uh, the eggs hatch. The caterpillar eats its eggs and then overwinters as a um, caterpillar. It won't eat anything else until spring comes. In early spring, they'll eat uh, violets, go through six instars instead of the normal five, then um, form a chrysalis, and after about two weeks, hopefully emerge as um, adult regal fritillaries, repeating the cycle for the next year. So where monarchs have three to five generations a year, regals only have the one. Um, here's a picture of a violet. They're, they can be pretty tough to spot when you're out in the field. 
Um, based on historical data, Nebraska's numbers are pretty good compared to the rest of the states, and we think that they're pretty stable, um, but the, the endangered species process has started for the regal fritillary. So why do we care about these two butterflies? They're both um, tier one species of greatest conservation need in Nebraska, which means that they're um, globally or nationally at risk of extinction and both are petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, this survey helps inform what future action should be taken uh, locally, statewide, and federally. What we hope to learn from this survey, um, we want to get some abundance uh, measures for the butterflies. Also, we can get presence. Um, if we do the survey long enough, we can probably get some absence measures as well. Also get to better know their range, foraging preferences, habitat characteristics, and behavior. So we burned through that pretty quickly. What questions do we have for just our intro to monarchs and regal fritillaries? So someone has asked, have monarchs become the charismatic megafauna of the pollinators and as such create an overemphasis on milkweed species that they rely on, but many, many other pollinators do not use? Um, most pollinators will use uh, milkweed flowers, um, but not a lot will use the um, the leaf or the stem that uh, the monarch caterpillars will eat, but most butterflies and bees will at least visit um, uh, the flower of milkweed. That is not to say that milkweed should be the only plant planted um, in a restoration or even your yard or garden. Um, getting a wide variety of native species out is about the best advice I can give you for especially broad pollinator conservation. Another question from Carol and Tim Hinkle. Do regal fritillaries use specific violet types? I don't think so. I think it is a pretty wide variety. Um, we usually go with the prairie violet when we're doing um, prairie restorations, but um, theoretically they would eat the violets in your yard, but it's very unusual to see a regal fritillary in town. They're usually um, found on remnant prairies, um, pretty high quality prairies. So um, they, they would eat others, but um, it just depends what's in their prairie. 